So continuing with our pure tone audiometry testing um, for air conduction um, that we will begin with for most patients. So there's a certain frequency order that we prefer um, uh, and that's recommended by ASHA. So we're going to be testing from 250 to 8000 hertz in octave steps, uh, meaning doubling of frequency. So 250 to 500, 500 to 1000, 1000 to 2000, 4000 and 8000. Asha recommends that we start with uh, 1000 hertz, and I believe it's because 1000 hertz has a clear tonal quality. And often uh, individuals have this uh, kind of high frequency sloping hearing loss, and their 1000 hertz um, thresholds might be better than the higher frequencies. The lower frequencies, um, some patients might find difficult to, to readily identify to begin with. So uh, again, that it's probably the reason why uh, we start with um, 1000 hertz. Um, as I said, we tested octave steps, but if there is a dramatic difference in the frequency uh, threshold between octaves, then Asha recommends that we test even mid octave uh, frequencies, such as 3000, that's between 2000 and 4000, and 6000, that's between 4000 and 8000 hertz. In some uh, test protocols, test protocols uh, such as that uh, we do for autotoxicity when we're monitoring if there's any hearing loss because of uh, antibiotics or chemotherapy, or if you're testing uh, individuals that uh, have a propensity for noise-induced hearing loss, then in the protocol itself, we might be testing um, 3000 and 6000 hertz along with other frequencies. The reason is, this type of hearing loss uh, might show up or might begin in these mid-octave frequencies, so we don't want to miss those um, the, the, that kind of hearing loss. Again, when we're doing pure audiometry, we are pretty much sampling the hearing ability at different points along the basal arm membrane. Uh, of course, as with any study, the more the number of samples we have, the better the representation of one's hearing but of course, considering the, the time efficiency, uh, we restrict ourselves to these frequencies. And it's been shown that that gives a, uh, a pretty reliable representation of one's hearing. There's different ways in which we can narrow down to the threshold. Uh, typically, we start at a low level, um, what we consider a level that's close to one's hearing threshold for that frequency. And then we go up in um, steps and try to narrow down uh, the threshold. So Asha again recommends that uh, we start at 30 dB HL. So we would um, start at 1000 Hertz at 30 dB HL. And if they don't hear that, uh, that tone for two presentations, then we go up in 20 dB steps um, for twi twice. And then we go up in 10 dB steps. Uh, the threshold tracking procedure that's recommended is that whenever we don't see a response, we go up in 10 dB. And when we see a response, uh, meaning that the patient has pressed the button or raised his hand, we go down by 5 dB steps. So we do that uh, till we get about 50%. Um, uh, for 50% of the presentations, we get a response. So it, the threshold is the lowest level at which the patient correctly identifies three out of six presentations. But for practical purposes, uh, if we see two responses for three presentations at the lowest level for that frequency, that would be considered the patient's threshold for that frequency for that year. So when we're beginning to test, we would uh, prefer to test the best year first, uh, the better year first. Uh, and we can get an idea of which one is a better year if the patient reports during his case history uh, that he hears better on one side and has been having any trouble listening to the other side. Or you might get some, uh, with experience, you might get some cues uh, 
uh, by observing the patient. Uh, for instance, the patient might uh, position himself such that is uh, one ear favors uh, you when you're uh, when you're talking to him during the case history process. So that'll kind of give you an idea that 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 ear is probably the better ear, uh, and you want to test start testing in the better ear first. So once you get the thresholds based on this uh, the frequency order that Asha recommends, you'll be plotting them in the audiogram using appropriate symbols. After you've got the thresholds for all those octave frequencies for both ears, you want to calculate uh, the Pewton average. And the Pewton average is the average of the air conduction thresholds for 500,000 and 2,000 hertz. And the reason why we calculate the Pewton average is um, because it's been shown to be a, a good estimate uh, of how his hearing levels are uh, for frequencies that are important uh, for speech understanding. Okay, And you'll be calculating this Pewton average for both ears. So the Pewton average is important to check our validity of our speech results. So one of the speech testing that you do is known as a speech reception threshold. Now, in other words, you're trying to find the threshold in which a person can identify speech about 50% of the time. Um, and typically you use word list that has spondees. These are two syllabic words which has equal stress on both words. And to check the validity of your um, you're testing, you want to see a good correspondence between the Pewton average and the speech reception threshold. And that's one of the reasons why the Pewton average is also known as the three frequency speech average. So in some audiograms, you might see that as, as coded as a three frequency speech average. Another important purpose of this Pewton average is uh, it also helps us determine the degree of hearing loss. Um, so when we talk about the audiogram, uh, we'll show what's, uh, we'll talk about how Asha recommends um, a, a classification of hearing loss. And uh, we use a Pewton average to determine uh, what is the degree of hearing loss uh, individually for each year. So once we're done with air conduction testing, we move on to test bone conduction. Um, uh, thresholds. Here, the bone conduction thresholds are important to verify the sensory neural sensitivity uh, for the different frequencies. So, when we talked about uh, uh, earlier uh, the difference between air conduction and bone conduction, we talked about how bone conduction sounds uh, kind of bypass the middle ear and the external ear and directly stimulate the inner, inner ear. So, in some conditions where the the uh, hearing loss is originating from a middle ear or an external ear problem, our bone conduction thresholds will be uh, are expected to be within normal limits. So when you compare your air conduction and bone conduction thresholds, uh, one would be able to determine where the hearing loss is coming from. Earlier bone conduction thresholds were assessed using tuning forks, but again for reasons that I uh, noted earlier, Tuning folks do not provide us a calibrated level of intensity, uh, and they're limited by the number of frequencies you can test. With the advent of audiometry, uh, now we can um, reliably estimate the hearing levels uh, for bone conduction uh, at different frequencies. So when you're doing bone conduction audiometry, uh, you place uh, the bone vibrator behind the pinna on the mastoid bone. Uh, some uh, researchers advocate using the forehead uh, instead of the mastoid for placing the bone vibrator. However, you need to uh, remember that when you're doing a forehead placement of a bone vibrator, the threshold you get uh, might be 10 dB poorer uh, than what you would estimate using um, a master placement for any given frequency. Again, we also talked about, when we talked about audiometers, how um, there is a maximum testable intensity for bone conduction, uh, for, for bone vibrators, 
because of the limitations of the diameter. Uh, so when you're doing a forehead placement and the threshold you get is 10 dB poorer, uh, that kind of limits us again uh, how far we can estimate the bone conduction thresholds uh, in the case that this person has a severe or a profound hearing loss. But sometimes you might have to resort using a forehead placement, uh, especially with young children. And it could be because uh, most bone vibrators come with a standard size band and with really small heads, you might not be able to place uh, the bone vibrator uh, correctly. And also there are some special cases where, uh, like for instance, if, uh, it's, if it's a congenital uh, syndrome, um, with some malformations of the head and uh, you might not be able to place a typical bone vibrator and also in cases where uh, the patient have had uh, has had recent uh, surgery in the middle ear uh, are on their mastoid so they might have scar tissue or they might still have inflammation behind the ears so that would preclude you from using a bone vibrator on the mastoid so you might have to use the forehead You need to realize that when you're testing with a bone vibrator, uh, you're testing bone conduction, the better cochlear responds uh, no matter where you place the bone vibrator. Okay. Typically, when you use uh, an earphone or an insert uh, earphone, uh, there is this loss of energy when, when sound travels from one side to another. Uh, and this is what we call as the interaural attenuation, uh, the attenuation meaning reduction of sound when it travels from one side to another. And it varies depending upon what kind of air conduction transducer you, you use. Uh, the problem with the bone vibrator is the interaural attenuation is almost uh, close to zero. In other words, whatever you're giving in one side, whatever energy you're giving in one side travels through the bone of the skull to the other side. Uh, the problem with that is now you don't know which ear is responding. In other words, you don't get ear specific results. So in this case, you might have, let's say, a normal hearing side, a normal hearing ear, while the other ear might be, well, completely uh, deaf or profoundly hearing impaired. However, if you were to place a bone vibrator on the deaf side, uh, the person might actually respond to at very low levels because that sound is traveling to the normal side and the patient responds that he heard it. So when you're doing bone conduction testing, um, the only way we can get ear specific results, and if you want to get ear specific results, you'll have to do this procedure known as masking. Masking is but a way to engage the better ear uh, while you're testing the poorer ear. Okay, and the way you do that is you try to uh, give a stimulus like uh, a narrow band noise or a speech noise and engage one ear while you're giving the tones to the other ear. Um, so you're giving this noise to the non-test ear while you're testing uh, all the test ear, which typically is a poorer ear. So in this course, and the audiograms that we're going to be talking about, um, we're not going to be talking in detail about masking, uh, but I just wanted you guys to know about what it entails to do masking. When you're doing bone conduction thresholds, when you're trying to estimate bone conduction thresholds, it's, you use a tracking procedure similar to air conduction. Uh, you test from 250 to 4,000 hertz. You don't test at 8,000 hertz. So you test 250, 500, 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000 hertz. And you plot uh, those thresholds on the audiogram using the appropriate symbols. For unmasked bone conduction thresholds, uh, you need to make sure that the ears are uncovered, uh, open. The reason for that is uh, 
a phenomenon known as the occlusion effect. So when ears that have uh, which are normal and ears with sensory neural hearing loss, in other words, if the hearing loss is uh, originating from the cochlea or the auditory nerve, when you're occluding uh, the ear, let's say with an earphone or if within, let's say even a, a simple earplug, there is an increase in the intensity of the sound uh, that's delivered by the bone conduction vibrator. And that's what we call as occlusion effect. So since there's an increase of the sound, you get lower thresholds if the ears are occluded. The reason for that is when you occlude the external auditory canal, it kind of traps the bone conducted vibrations uh, in the space between the occlusion, in other words, between the earplug and the tympanic membrane. Regular, um, normally, there is a certain amount of the bone conducted sounds escaping through an open ear canal. But now, when we occlude it, uh, the sounds get trapped inside. And we know from our basic acoustics that as the volume of a space decreases, the pressure increases, the sound of a pressure increases. So that results in better thresholds. So it seems like it's, the sounds are louder. And this happens predominantly for the lower frequencies, frequencies that are lower than 1,000 hertz. But the increase or the improvement in the threshold can be as much as 20 dB lower. And it also depends upon how deep the insertion is. So in this graph, you're seeing that um, with deeper insertion uh, of this ear plug, you, the amplitude of the sound is higher. Uh, okay. What's interesting is you don't see this occlusion effect. In other words, a difference between hearing when your ears are open and with, when your ears are occluded in ears that have a conductive uh, hearing loss. The reason is when you're having a conductive hearing loss, the occlusion effect is in place already. Okay, in other words, whatever improvement you expect to see uh, with bone conduction is already in, in place. So you doing another occlusion does not make a difference. In fact, that's been used in some tuning fork tests where they uh, place the tuning fork, uh, vibrating tuning fork on the forehead and the physician or the um, the audiologist might uh, ask the patient if there's any change in the loudness when they're manually closing and opening the ear canal. Uh, for those who have a sensory neural hearing loss and if they can hear the tone, they would report that when they close the ear canal uh, by pressing on the tragus, there is an increase in the loudness of the sound. But if the patient has a conductive hearing loss, such as when there's a fluid in the middle ear or if there's a perforation in the eardrum, um, they don't experience any difference in the loudness. And that was used in earlier days to kind of for differential diagnosis of a conductive and a sensory neural hearing loss. And as I said, this increase in the loudness is uh, predominantly for the lower frequencies. And you might have experienced that. You might have noticed that when you have your ears closed or plugged, uh, your chewing sounds louder and uh, your voice sounds more booming. Uh, and again, that's because of the increase in the loudness of the lower pitches, the lower frequencies, uh, kind of giving you that effect that uh, uh, the voice is more boomy.